Hello and welcome to Acid Base Balance. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too as we talk today about acid base balance. When we talk about the acid base balance in the body, we're talking about this balance between two opposing forces that are trying to change the pH of the blood and the tissues. If we take a look at the pH scale here, you can see a what we'd call neutral type of scale as 7 in the middle, and the scale goes from 0 to 14. So on the low end there, the zero end, you can see that we go all the way down to maybe battery acid and move our way up to stomach acid, vinegar, orange juice, tomatoes, black coffee, urine at six, water at seven, and then we start moving up into more of an alkaline scale. So if the numbers are low, we're in an acidic state. If the numbers are high, we're in an alkalinic state. Let's go all the way over to kind of the scary end of the alkaline state here, which would be drain cleaner, followed by bleach and soapy water, ammonia, ingestion tablets, baking soda, and then down back to seawater and water. So you can see that we have kind of a universal scale here moving back and forth. Now in the body, we want to try to keep that pH right around 7.4. So you see it's a little bit higher than water. So our body is not just made up of water. If it was, we'd just be water. So you have to have some tissues in there. You have to have blood cells and plasma and so on. So it's a little bit more than just water. And that gives it that extra little boost up to that 7.4. When we talk about pH, what we're talking about is an inverse logarithm. In other words, if you move from 1 to 2 on the pH scale, it's not just one place. It's 10 times as much. So moving from 7 to 8 is not just moving up one place in the logarithm or in the pH scale. It's moving up 10 times. It's 10 times as concentrated, in this case if we're moving to 7 to 8, it's 10 times as concentrated alkali as it would be at 7. And again, if the number is high, okay, that's going to indicate that we have a very alkalotic situation. If the number is low, it indicates very acidic. One of our major forces here that is controlling our pH is going to be a hydrogen ion. And if there's lots of hydrogen ions, think about hydrogen ions as being the acid part. If there's lots of them, that means we're going to have a lot of acid. If there's not many hydrogen ions, that means that we're not going to have a lot of acid and we'll be very alkaline. So what are the major producers of acid in the body? They include anaerobic metabolism, CO2 production, now that's just normal aerobic type metabolism. You're exercising, you're producing CO2, so that's just a normal production of acid in the body. Fatty acid oxidation, ketone production, phospholipid, these are all components of metabolism. So when you're taking a look at a lot of this, this is just normal metabolism. Now that can be kicked up a little bit by things like exercise or by uh, the amount of food that we eat or maybe anaerobic metabolism. So those things can be kicked up a little bit by some of those components. What we're looking at at the bottom of the screen here is called the carbonic acid equation where we have this carbonic acid in the middle, H2CO3, and that can break up into, on the left side, CO2 and water, or on the right side, hydrogen ions, and bicarb. This equation, this carbonic acid equation, is what is going to allow the body to adjust pH and keep it in the normal range. So if you eat some really spicy food or you take an antacid, why don't you become acidotic or alkalotic? Because your body is going to adjust using these mechanisms to be able to maintain and control your pH. On the left hand side of the screen there we have the CO2 and the water. Those are going to be regulated and excreted by the lung. It's 
the lung can get rid of some water vapor, can get rid of CO2, obviously, by our respiratory rate. On the right-hand side, we have the hydrogen ions and the bicarb. Those are regulated by the kidney. The kidney can dump off those hydrogen ions. It can help to produce more bicarb. So we can control how much of those components is in the body via the kidney. And we're going back and forth then between the centerpiece and the centerpiece is our buffer. So the carbonic acid is going to be our buffer. That's the piece that is helping us to move from one side to the other to be able to compensate when there's different problems that are occurring in the body. Let's say that, for example, your patient has got a renal problem and they can't get rid of some of those hydrogen ions. Well, we can go through the buffer. We can go through carbonic acid to get over to the other side of the equation and the patient can pick up their respiratory rate and blow off some CO2. So let's take a look at our respiratory control of pH. We have our PaCO2, our PaO2, and our pH. Those are all controlling our central and peripheral chemoreceptors, which then send impulses to the respiratory center in the brain to say, hey, we should breathe faster or breathe slower, depending upon what the patient's pH is, their CO2 level is, and the PaO2, which isn't really a direct control over pH. Instead, we're trying to increase or decrease oxygenation, but it is going to have an effect because as you change the respiratory rate, as you change alveolar ventilation, there will be changes in the CO2. We breathe faster, breathe slower, there's gonna be changes in the CO2. So even though the lungs may be compensating for an oxygen problem, we can see those effects in our CO2 and therefore in our pH. Renal control of pH is from the tubular cell. So in the kidney itself, we're going to have the tubular cell down there, and that is going to help to control our pH as well. Let's take a look at the top part of the equation there, where we have hydrogen ions and bicarb. So we can be moving the hydrogen ions out to the urine, dumping them off. We can be moving the bicarb into the bloodstream to help to buffer the bloodstream. We can be moving the water out so the CO2 remains. Remember again, through this carbonic acid equation. And then the CO2 and the bicarb would buffer each other out. So again, remembering the sides of the equation there, that bicarb and hydrogen ions were one formation, hydrogen ions being the acid, bicarb being the base. Move down to the bottom there, water and CO2, CO2 is the acid, and the water would be the base. So we can try to manipulate our blood pH by manipulating how much of the hydrogen ions and water are being dumped by the kidney or how much of the water and CO2 is being dumped by the lung. There's other buffers in the body as well. Hemoglobin is going to be our big one there. So we can have CO2 and hydrogen ions that are binding up to hemoglobin, and that also helps to serve as a buffer. This is probably the fastest buffering system that the body has. If you have an acute change in your pH, hemoglobin is going to kind of kick in there and it's going to start the buffering process right away. Whereas if we're counting on the lungs, well the lungs can move pretty fast. They can start breathing faster or slower, but the kidneys are going to take time. That's going to take hours for them to start dumping off more water or more hydrogen ions. We can also do an exchange in the intracellular and extracellular fluids of ions, including potassium and hydrogen ions in and out of the cells. So how do we find these things? Typically it's going to be with an arterial blood gas. So we would do a blood stick for a blood gas and our normal arterial blood pH is 7.4 so we would expect that our blood gas would be somewhere in that range of about 7.35 to 7.45. You see how it tightly controls right around 7.4. Acidosis being an increase in hydrogen ion concentration and a decrease in bicarb. Whereas alkalosis is a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration and an increase in bicarb. Now here I just list out some of the common acid-base imbalances. Keep in mind that if you want to learn how to analyze arterial blood gases, watch our video, The Six Easy Steps to ABG Interpretation. 
Respiratory acidosis is the result of having decreased ventilation and a buildup of CO2. Respiratory alkalosis is the result of increased alveolar ventilation and a decrease in CO2, blowing off that CO2. Metabolic acidosis results when we have too many acids, too much of that hydrogen ion, and not enough bicarb. A metabolic alkalosis, on the other hand, results from having not enough acids or too much bicarb in the blood. Another measure we can use to help us analyze blood gases is called the base excess. What the base excess tells us about is the magnitude of the metabolic component of that acid-base imbalance. So there's going to be situations where you have a patient who has both a metabolic and a respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. And in those situations, we may have to check to find out what part of that is metabolic. How much of this can you correct by the respiratory system? Maybe it's a patient with COPD, for example. And how much of this is metabolic that you'd need to correct in a different way? What our base excess measures is all of the total body bases. This includes hemoglobin, and we just talked about that hemoglobin is the primary metabolic base that's floating around in the body. But we also have chlorides, phosphates, sulfates, albumin is a good one too. And all of those things help to bind up some of the acid in the body. Now our normal base excess is plus two to minus two, so right around zero. There shouldn't be an excess of base or alkaline, it should be right around zero. If the number is positive, it indicates alkalosis. If the number is negative, it indicates an acidosis. The other component that we may look at too is called an anion gap. In an anion gap, it helps us to determine the source of an acidosis. It's a combination of looking at the positive ions in the body, the major positive ones being sodium and potassium, and subtracting from that the major negative ions in the body, which are chloride and bicarb. We come up with what's called a ratio of positive to negative anions in the body, and that would be between 10 and 15 milliequivalents per liter. A high ratio is considered to be greater than 15, a low ratio considered to be less than 10. And then these things can help us to be able to determine what the source is of a metabolic acidosis. Okay, this is all metabolic here. So this will help us to be able to determine the source. What we're looking at is we're looking at how these became anions, how these, this acid became to be formed from losing and gaining the electrons. High ratio type anion gaps, that's things like a ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, renal failure, toxic ingestions. A normal ratio anion gap could be the result of GI losses or renal bicarbonate losses. And a low ratio typically would be, although rare, associated with a low albumin level. Well, thank you for joining me for acid base balance. Again, if you'd like to learn how to interpret your arterial blood gases, please visit our Six Easy Steps to ABG Analysis and our other ABG case studies and work. Thanks for joining me again. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.